have is, is the latest version. Um, so who here has written Spark before? Any Spark-like programs? OK. Uh, who's seen error messages like this? Uh-huh. <laughs> Seems to be a one-to-one -one mapping there. Um, so this, in this talk, we're going we're gonna to just explore uh, some error conditions in, um, in Spark. Um, and we're going to sort of do this as sort of similar to you know, walking down the street as you're kind of walking over these like manhole covers, uh, manholes. And uh, you know, you don't really sort of think about manholes uh, very much until um, something really bad happens. And uh, in this case, uh, then you start investigating like, hey, why, why did this error occur? Um, what is it that we can learn from it? Um, and we'll use this as sort of a way to, to dig into some of the Spark uh, internals. Um, so let's get started. So this is uh, one of the most common um, error messages uh, that, that you would run into as you're starting to like, work on, uh, on Spark. And this can be a little intimidating, so we're just going like, to break it down a little bit. Um, what's really important is at the very top, there's a these three um, words that are specific to Spark that really, Spark is telling you that something bad's happened, um, but you sort of need to understand what these mean before you kind of see what the real error is. The, the punchline here is that this is actually like our fault as a user, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, so let's start uh, at the top. So it says here that um, the job has, uh, has failed um, because the stage has failed and task one of stage zero has failed four times. Um, what, so what is a job um, in Spark land? So let's talk about that first and then kind of go down the, uh, down the rabbit hole. Um, so to start, um, to start to understand what a job is in Spark, we can start with a very simple example. Um, so this here, um, grabs the Spark context, so SC is the Spark context. It reads a, a text file from HDFS. Uh, it does like a cast, uh, basically you have string to integer, and then it just says, hey, get me everything that's bigger than 10, and then gives me a sum. Great, now uh, from this code, the thing that actually generates a job is the sum, uh, which is the, uh, the last statement. Uh, and that's because in Spark, Spark is uh, does like uh, deferred execution. So it actually doesn't do anything until you say, hey, go run this job. The other parts of this um, are really instructions to Spark to tell it how to uh, transform data coming in uh, into uh, our last uh, job, which, or our last piece, which is like uh, the sum. Um, so what is a stage? Uh, which is sort of the next term that we were looking at in our, in, our error, uh, in our error message. Well, before we talk about a stage, let's introduce a few more topics, a few more concepts in Spark. So let's talk about partitions first. And I promise this will, this will lead into something. Uh, um, so uh, in Spark, a partition um, is really just a chunk of data. And you can think of it as like just um, a, uh, a de the degree of parallelism uh, that, it, that Spark has. Uh, so uh, the degree of parallelism at any point in time in Spark. Um, so in our example here, uh, we're reading from HDFS, and uh, by default, you, Spark will create one partition per block on HDFS. Um, you could also pass in a parameter like we did here that does four, which is saying that, hey, we want uh, at minimum four partitions. So if you want to repartition the data or uh, to begin with, you could do that. Uh, just for simplicity here, we'll just assume that there's four partitions. So that's, that's partitions. Now, um, the next thing are RDDs. Now, RDDs are the, the definition of, or the, the acronym stands for the Resilient Distributed Data Set, but really what it is, you can think of this as uh, just a, a collection of partitions uh, with instructions on how to, tr how to transform incoming partitions to, out to outgoing partitions. Um, and in this case, um, when we say, hey, SC text file, we, we're creating a RDD, and that RDD has instructions within it how to read data out of HDFS and create these partitions, which uh, read blocks out of HDFS and create these partitions that are, act that are a Spark concept. Um, one sec. 
Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, uh, the next instruction map uh, does sort of a similar thing. So it creates an RDD uh, that has the uh, information on how to, how to do the mapping. Um, and RDDs have uh, uh, pointers back to like the previous RDD that, that, uh, that created them. So that's what this arrow here is. And filter, we do sort of the same thing. The reason that they're like duplicate, like it's showing you more than one, is because internally Spark actually will, uh, uh, could have multiple RDDs that are actually linked together. So there isn't really a, like it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping between like a line of code, like a map to one RDD specifically. Um, that's sort of like hidden away from you. So that's why it's, it's not exactly like this, but this is just for simplicity. Um, and then at the end, we collect all of our partitions that have been transformed and we output the sum. That's sort of a very simple example of a Spark program. And in Spark, the, uh, this RDD chain, so RDD1, RDD2, and RDD3, um, is what's called the, sort of referred to as like the lineage. So this is like the lineage part of, like, of Spark. So we're saying that, hey, in order to compute the sum, we actually had to uh, go through, uh, to compute the sum from the source data from HDFS, we have to go through all these transformations. And we keep track of this information. And so if any partition fails, we can then go back and recompute um, that specific partition. So if, so if an RDD3 partition two failed, we know how to go back and compute that if uh, the host that was processing it um, failed. That's the lineage part. And as you can see here, there are dependencies between RDDs. Now, Spark, there are multiple types of dependencies. Um, there's narrow and wide dependencies. And so what we've shown in this previous example are, are uh, narrow dependencies because um, the, what that means is that you can actually process all these transformations independent of like sibling partitions. So you don't, uh, in order to compute in RDD3 partition one, you don't need to know about you know, partition two of RDD2. You can just uh, take all the partitions, spread them across your cluster, do all the transformations and then collect them at the very end. Um, but sometimes you need what are called Y dependencies. And that's if you have transformations that uh, take a series of uh, partitions. So uh, to generate the new partition, you actually need information from more than one previous partition. So there isn't like a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, this, for example, is like a join or a group by key, these kinds of uh, uh, transformations. Um, and at the Y dependency, Layer, this is where stage boundaries get created. Okay, so this is now uh, that, that word stage. Um, so let's, let's uh, walk through sort of a, another more interesting example. This is uh, uh, creating three RDDs, and like we said before, uh, nothing really happens until that very last line, which is the RDD3.collect. Everything else just like sets up uh, chains of RDDs like on the driver. Um, nothing really happens. So let's look at these individually. So here, we're reading from a HDFS file. Uh, we're mapping. Um, the, we're passing in some closure, and then we're also filtering and passing in some closure. Um, whoa. Not entirely sure what happened there. I think I actually have bad luck with slides because two days ago there was like two fire alarms while I was giving a talk. So I, it's not, okay, let's go back. Um, <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Um, so, uh, these are, uh, the, the rest of the statements break down into these, um, uh, into these uh, different stages. So we can see here that in order to compute um, stage three, we need to first finish stage two. Um, and in order to compute stage uh, four, we need to wait until stage one is computed. So these are like the, these are the stage boundaries in Spark. And Spark will take your program, like that, that program that we saw, and break it up into the different stages. Uh, and schedule, these, schedule this work and actually wait until uh, dependent stages are done. And these are the, the actual boundaries. These are wide dependencies in Spark. Um, so, okay. <laughs> um, so why, why, does this, uh, why does this matter? So let's go back to our error. So in our error, um, we're, uh, we're saying that, hey, the job failed because of a stage failure. 
and that's caused because of a task failure. So what's a task? Well, a task uh, is a sort of the, the computation that happens on, uh, on a partition. So within a stage, um, we have, um, uh, okay, so, yeah, so within a stage, uh, we had four partitions and we have four tasks. Uh, we assign a task per partition and uh, these tasks run um, in our executors and we'll get to that in, in a little bit. But what this error message is really telling us is that, hey, there was a failure um, that happened. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, yeah, can you guys go back? Um, so what it's really what it's really saying is um, there were four there were four failures that happened, and in Spark. Um, this is configurable, but uh, by default, if you have four task failures inside of a stage, it will fail the stage, which will fail the job. Uh, and you can actually modify this. Uh, this is the command. This is the config option. Uh, if you want to have more more failures, it just means like how fast do you want to fail? Uh, so by default, there's it's four. Um, it's sort of random. Um, or I don't think there was actually any. It's like a heuristic, really. Uh, but you can you can modify this. And so, looking back at this error. Uh, what we see is um, uh, that our entire job failed, and really what the, what the real error is that there was a number format exception. So that was actually our fault, but that's because like, there, was, there was an issue in a task which caused the stage to fail, which caused the whole job to fail. Um, yeah. So um, let's look at a, a, different, um, a different kind of failure. Yeah. Okay, so this is, um, we're getting a file system closed uh, exception, um, and this you'd get in a, in a driver. Um, and this is sort of, a, um, it's telling us that there is an issue, um, and it, it's coming from our cluster manager. Um, so before we talk about cluster managers, uh, let's, let's, let's look a little bit more in the actual Spark, how Spark is architected. Um, so. Spark has a driver, and uh, the drivers communicate these executors. And the way you can think about it is that the driver is sort of like doing all the work. It has like the scheduler, which, which breaks down our, our, our jobs into, the, uh, into that DAG that we saw. Um, and it's issuing different jobs. These could be independent jobs. Um, and each job is broken up into tasks, and these tasks are sent out to, they're scheduled on executors. Executors uh, could be seen as, uh, they're like thread pool executors in Java. It's basically just like something uh, that has like a number of threads, and each thread, each task runs on a separate thread, um, and that's how you get like parallelism in, in Spark. Now, this can run in multiple cluster managers. So it's a, there's a pluggable cluster manager uh, feature in Spark. So you can run this. Um, uh, you can run this on standalone mode. So you have a you have a worker workers running on all your clusters, on all your nodes, and a, and a master. Uh, you can run this locally on just like a like a local cluster mode, um, but you can run this in Mesos if you want to get some resource management, and you can run this in Yarn, uh, which gives you again uh, you know similar like resource management features. So you can have multiple Spark jobs running at the same time using different you know, resource pools and things like that. So uh, it's good for like multi-tenant clusters. Um, so let's talk about Yarn. Yarn. Um, this is sort of a very simplistic uh, sort of diagram of how Yarn works. Uh, and, and we're only going to talk about sort of the things that really matter to us. But in Yarn, there's a resource manager, um, and then there are node managers. And uh, there's one, typically one resource manager that runs, and you have a node manager on each machine. Um, and a node manager um, has a concept of a container, which really is like a process that's just rooted under the node manager. Uh, so it's like a process with some extra metadata. Um, and if you submit a Yarn job, um, the client will create what's uh, will ask the node manager um, will create an application master that's specific to that job. So like MR2, let's say, or Spark in this case, uh, will create an application master that's running on our cluster under a node manager. Uh, it will request for resources, uh, however many you s you've asked for, um, 
and it will create a number of uh, processes uh, that are tied to, uh, that are rooted under the node managers, and that's depending on how many resources you want. You can specify how many containers you want, how much memory and CPU you want to allocate to those. Um, so in the Spark case, um, the, way to, the way this maps, and it's one of the ways that it maps, is that the driver is running in uh, our application master. So as a client, we do Spark submit, we submit a job, uh, and we run the driver inside of, the inside of one of the containers, and then we ask for the resources, however many we have suggested or we've asked for, and then those uh, spin up the executors as containers under the node manager. So um, that's sort of how, that's, that's how it's uh, managed. Um, another way to run your Yarn jobs is you can, you can um, have the driver uh, running under uh, on the client itself, and so this is this is what's called like Yarn client mode, um, and this is if you type in like Spark shell, uh, you want to have the driver running locally on your machine that's submitting the job, or even not even just for Spark shell. If you just want to like have the logs and you want to have the driver running locally, uh, you do it as a Yarn in Yarn client mode. The previous one that I showed, uh, where the driver runs in the application master. Um, is uh, Yarn cluster mode. Uh, and there are different trade-offs of why you want to do one over the, over the other. Um, but uh, the, um, so getting back, so this is sort of an example of, and I can get into the reasons later, uh, um, but uh, why you want to use one over the other. But um, yeah, this is sort of a command that you'd run. You say, okay, I want two gigabytes of memory. I, I want Yarn client mode, so it'd run the driver on our, on our client. Uh, and I want two executors and two cores. So this will go and request all the resources from Yarn and, and set up your, uh, set up and run your job. Um, your job is, a, is another parameter here, I didn't show it. So um, if we do a little bit more digging and we look at the node manager logs after we saw that file system closed error, we see something like this. And this is one of the most um, common errors that you have when you run Spark on Yarn. Um, so if you start seeing weird behavior, I suggest looking at the node manager logs. And a lot of times you'll see something like this. And so let's look at this error. This error is saying uh, current usage is 2.2 gigabytes um, of 2.1 physical memory. Uh, so we're killing your container, which is killing an executor. And you're like, okay, well, first of all, I only requested for two gigabytes. And why am I at 2.1 gigabytes? And why, or, or why are you saying that I, I've actually requested for 2.1, but I'm actually using 2.2? Um, well, the dirty secret is that when you request, when you request this executor memory of two gigabytes, that's not actually what gets requested in Yarn. Um, what gets requested in Yarn is something a little bit more, and we'll explain this uh, right now. So this Spark executor memory, that is the two gigabytes, is your heap size, uh, and you're saying, hey, I want two gigabytes across all of my cores. Uh, this memory is split up into two sections. It's split up into uh, the shuffle memory fraction, which is uh, about 40% of your heap. And it's also uh, split up into the storage fraction, which is 60% of your heap. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a coincidence that it maps one-to-one -one with uh, your garbage collector, young gen and old gen, actually. That's done on purpose. So if you want to modify these fractions, you should also modify your garbage collector. Otherwise, you'd get, you're would get you going to be getting pretty bad performance in uh, uh, in your shuffle, because you'd be doing a lot of old gen like garbage collection. Just as a side note, just be careful not to modify these without modifying your garbage collector. Um, so this will give us our two gigabytes, but what we also do is we also uh, request, um, uh, when we're submitting to Yarn, we're, we have a, there's a, this memory overhead, which is the JVM overhead plus additional memory that we, we think we need uh, to run our Spark job, that is um, off-heap memory. So Yarn is very particular that if you exceed the amount of like RSS memory that you said that you need, it will kill you, uh, which is not the same in like standalone mode. Standalone mode, from what I remember last time I used it, uh, you could just use as much memory as you want. Uh, but Yarn is very specific. So if you use more than uh, how much you said, and this can happen if you're using Snappy, uh, if you're using other libraries that have like native code that allocate memory outside of the JVM um, and you exceed your quota, like we did in our error message, um, Yarn will kill you. So what you have to do is you have to go up and up the, uh, the overhead. So by default, as I showed in the previous slide, 
Um, it's 7% before Spark 1.4, and then Spark 1.4 uh, and up, uh, we, we bumped it up to 10%. Uh, but this is also configurable. You can, you can configure it yourself um, if you think you need more, uh, more overhead memory. Um, and that is really what caused that error, the file system like closed error and the, uh, the error that uh, we saw in our node manager. So sometimes uh, our jobs are just slow. Um, and not only are they sometimes slow, but sometimes they run out of memory uh, if you've used uh, Spark before. Uh, and this is sort of, this is a out of, essentially an out of memory error. We're saying that we're spending way too much time in garbage collection, which means that we've essentially run out of memory because we're always doing garbage collection. Not always, but a large chunk of the time. And we can see this in our, um, we can see this in our uh, Spark web UI. So if you look at, uh, this is a breakdown of all, the of all the executors that are running, all the tasks, sorry, that, that, are, that have been running in, uh, on the executors. We see this like GC time here, and we can see that uh, in this case, um, we're spending about half the time in uh, garbage collection, which is, which is not good. Um, so this is typically, and this is generalities, obviously. I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's exceptions. But typically, this is done because this happens when you have a lot of spilling going on on your, um, on your reduced side of, of, your, uh, of your job. Um, so looking back at our previous um, example here, um, at, these, at these wide dependencies, we have to do shuffles. And that's because, by definition of what a wide dependency is, we need information in order to, to do, in order to process one of our, our later stages, we need, uh, we need keys or the records uh, from more than one of the partitions that came from the previous stage. So we need to shuffle the data around and collect all the keys uh, that are the same uh, to go onto, the, onto one of the reducers. So let's look at the, oh yes, and yeah, most of the performance issues that we've seen are caused because of shuffles, either because of partitions or just unnecessarily unnecessarily um, doing shuffling. Um, so let's look at one of the, let's look at one of the uh, reducers um, a little bit more in detail. So in uh, what, what's going on in a, in a reduce step is you have a reducer that needs to get uh, data from um, the previous stages um, uh, output. So you have uh, a reduce that's going in and grabbing blocks from various, and in this in this case it's only two, but you, typically it's like from all of the all, all of the nodes that uh, uh, sorry all of the mappers from the previous um, uh, stage. So you, you're getting this data, and as you're getting the data, uh, you're appending it to a map, and then you're uh, you're getting all your keys uh, and you're sorting it, and then if you actually can't fit all that in memory, and this is where this uh, shuffle memory fraction comes into play. Because uh, this is the memory that's being used specifically for shuffle. So, like for example, if you're if you have a process, or if you have a uh, a job that actually isn't using any caching, um, and you're seeing you're running actually out of a lot of memory when you're doing shuffles or you're spilling a lot, uh, that's when you can start looking into modifying those uh, those fractions. Because uh, you basically are giving up 60% of your heap if you're not doing any RDD cache, and, and you're not doing any RDD caching, so uh, you can't use that memory. So, getting back to this. Um, uh, if you run out of memory, you spill uh, this map onto disk. And before Spark 1, I believe it was, um, you, Spark would just fail. Uh, I believe it was Spark 1 or 1.1 1 .1 where uh, spilling was actually added. Um, so it will spill to disk. But what happens, though, is if you spill too much to disk, um, it will cause Spark to, uh, it will add because you're processing so much data and you're spilling to disk while also reading more blocks, it will cause a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the garbage collector. Um, and you'll see, uh, you'll see this kind of error that we, sh we, we saw before. Um, so what's, what's sort of the, the problem here? Or what's sort of the solution? Well, one of, the, one of the things that we tell our customers and people using uh, Spark is that you have to really fall in love with the num partitions that uh, is part of most of the uh, transformations in Spark. And what this is saying is it's saying that, hey, when you do, in, when you create, uh, after you're done the, the map task before this reduction, I want you to generate 1,000 partitions. So 
uh, the reducers are only going to deal with 1,000 partitions. Um, if, let's say, you're reading from HDFS and HDFS is giving you um, 10, uh, it's giving you like 100 partitions, and then your map actually balloons that data, well, you're only by default going to get um, 100 partitions on your reduced side. What this is saying is like, no, 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 no. When you're doing that map and you're reading from HDFS and you do some transformation, I want you to actually create 1,000 partitions. So it'll create smaller partitions. Um, and now our, on, the on the reduced side, uh, we will be processing smaller partitions. And when we do that, uh, we can actually hopefully fit it in memory um, and not cause any, any spill to disk. Um, so the, all, the real question is, why not set partitions to infinity uh, if that's the case, right? Um, well, then you get uh, excessive parallelism, um, which, which uh, after some point, what ends up happening is your scheduler overhead, so the amount of time that's spent inside of the driver scheduling all these tasks um, actually ends up uh, being more than the amount of time that you spend uh, doing the processing, right? So you have all this overhead now that you're paying for. You're also uh, reading, you're also doing more um, disk seeks um, because what ends up happening is uh, you end up, depending on the type of uh, shuffle you do, uh, you end up writing a lot more files uh, to disk and then each task has to go in and read those files. So you can, you can imagine that if, you're, if, you, want, if you want to um, create, um, if you have 100 partitions that you're reading on the reduced side, uh, each one and you have 10 cores that are available to you, you're gonna do like 10 waves through all of your, uh, all of your cores, right? Um, and each time you, actually, you wanna do the reduction, you have to go back to the previous stage and read data from disk because between shuffles, um, you're materializing the disk all the time, right? So the data comes in, materializes to disk, um, and, then the, and then the reducer goes in and reads that, and that's how it does the reduction. So if you have many, 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 many partitions, you're gonna keep reading from disk more and more and more and more. So that's, that's one of the downsides of having too many partitions. And now we're talking about like if you have way too many partitions. Um, and then the driver also has uh, accounting data structures that it has to uh, keep track of all of this memory, uh, knowing where, which reducers ran. All these, all these data structures need to be um, uh, start growing larger and larger on the driver side, um, which doesn't horizontally scale. You only have like one driver. Um, so how do you choose this? Well, <laughs> well, we have a very scientific formula for this, which is um, keep multiplying by 1.5 until things, until like things settle down uh, or until you see your performance plateau. This is the easiest answer. This is, um, this is something that uh, what we see is our customers are, um, depending on the amount of data that comes in, uh, they use that as a multiplier. Um, so they know how their, how their data uh, fans in and fans out. Um, and then they can use that and add some multiplier onto the original source and, and, and sort of determine how many partitions to generate throughout the, the Spark job. Um, there, is, uh, there is actually a formula that you can use, um, but we're not gonna get into that. Uh, if you guys are interested, uh, you can come find me after. But uh, the easiest thing is just, like I said, just keep multiplying by, uh, keep increasing it by 50% and, um, and just see where your performance tapers off. Uh, is the easy, is the sort of the easy answer. So, to conclude, um, is Spark uh, bad? Not really, it's just that uh, distributed systems are just really hard uh, and complicated to deal with, and so some of these, uh, some of these problems are just uh, the nature of uh, distributed systems. Um, we could do better, uh, and we're working on it in the community to make uh, error handling uh, easier reporting, easier, more transparency, and especially around memory consumption. So Spark can get better. It's just that some of these are just issues with uh, um, the nature of like distributed systems. That's sort of my cop out. Um, thank you. Um, we have mics if anyone has any questions. Uh, sorry about the slides going all crazy a few times. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks.
have a uh, sorry. I have a question about this uh, um, reduce uh, setting to thousand, right? The partitions. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like a one size fits all approach, right? Just like the high queries, you need um, you if you it's a multi stage high query, and you set uh, number of reducers and mappers or memory to, and it applies to all the stages. Even though one stage could be really needing the extra memory bump or you know the extra number of mappers reducers in Hive. So same is kind of happening here, like one of the stages is uh, kind of slow or needs the extra memory, but we have to just give it to all of them. Um, so let me, let me understand the question. You're saying like, do you have to set the same number of partitions for all of your stages? Right, that's a, that's a setting at a global level, right? It's not at a per Oh, you're talking stage. about in Spark SQL? Right. Yeah, so in Spark SQL, it is at the global level. Um, this is a, this wasn't talking specifically about Spark SQL. This is if you're writing like, you know, Spark core jobs where you actually can specify the number of partitions. In Spark SQL, yeah, there is one parameter that's like how many partitions do we want. Um, so that's something that we have to fix. So it's here as well, right? In this job, uh, we set it to just uh, at the start of the uh, job. Yeah, so in Spark SQL, you do set it at the start. Um, if you're not using Spark SQL, you can set it at, you know, per transformation if you want. Okay. Yeah, uh, but like I said, we just need to, we, um, there is an upstream GR actually to fix this so that we can determine um, the number of partitions dynamically, and that's sort of like one of the, that's more of the correct answer, which is can we actually use statistics as we're executing the job to determine the number of partitions that we need, and then Spark SQL would be able to take advantage of that. Okay. I had, I had one more question. Yeah, you can go ahead. No. This should probably be fairly quick. Oh. This, this question was about shuffle, yeah. and specifically, um, does sorting always happen on the reduce side after the shuffle? Um, does sorting always happen on the reduce side after? So the example you gave showed that. So you said it sorts before it starts spinning. Yeah. So uh, if you wanna, if you wanna do the reduction, we do. It does a shuffle, yeah, it, I believe it always does a shuffle, because otherwise you can't like reduce the, the keys, right? You can't group them together, because they're coming in from various blocks from like the, uh, the previous stage. Right, it does. Um, but what about, is, is sorting always done after a shuffle? Um, yes, I believe so. It has to, right? Otherwise, like, how are you gonna do the, how are you gonna reduce, you so how are you gonna map. do a group in a, or a reduction? You can use a hash map based reduction. Um, I think that was what the earlier versions of Spark used. So the, yeah, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe you could avoid the shuffle. I, th I mean the, the sort, I thought, like when I was, when I was reading through the, like, um, the external like append only map, it does, it always does a sort to do the, to do the reduction to do the, like, the combining, um, but I could be missing something, yeah. Would you mind saying a little bit about tuning garbage collection when you're tuning the memory fractionals? Um, so, like I said, the, 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 the fractions, the memory fractions are pinned to, so by default, your garbage collector, um, uh, you have a, you know, you have your young gen and you have your old gen, um, as a high level, and the 40, you get, by default, you get 40%, right, on your, on your young gen, and 60% on your old gen. Um, so if you modify those, those fractions, um, you have to also change the young gen and old gen fractions, because what will happen is, if you, if you give the shuffle more memory, um, but, you, so let's say instead of doing 40% for the shuffle, you say, oh, I actually want to reverse that. I want 60% for the shuffle and 40% for the, um, uh, for, the, uh, for the cache, and you don't modify your garbage collector, well, you're going to end up promoting a lot, of, a, lot of the, a lot of the objects that are inside of your young gen are going to get promoted to the old gen. Um, and if that fills up, you're going to cause like a stop of the world like collection on the old gen. So that's why you want to make sure that they line up so that you have enough space on your young gen. Because typically, what, like the way that it's set up is all your shuffle, like all your all the memory that you're using in your shuffle is like uh, ephemeral, right? It's just going to sit there. You're going to do your like reduction or whatever transformation you want, and then you're going to throw it away. Um, so you don't want any of that really to get promoted to the old gen. Uh, you really want that to be like in the young gen and only do like the, the parallel garbage collection that could happen. 
Um, so that's where you have to be careful. Um, yeah, and it's there's a lot more into like tuning uh, that we can get into, but that's that's sort of like the basic uh, idea. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Uh, so, what is the best we can do in terms of those long call stacks with all these uh, auto-generated names for this uh, lambdas and things like that? Uh, how far can we go in terms of fixing the UI or uh, things like that to make the debugging experience easier? Um, so those, you're talking about like the dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and non dollar right. sign three. Right. Yeah, that's like a that's a Scala thing, right? It does because what Scala does is it it goes and creates an, uh, a bunch of like anonymous uh, objects underneath, right? Because it's running on the JVM. So I you I don't know how we can aside from like writing stuff in Java. Uh, which won't create all these unnecessary objects that are anonymous. I'm not sure how we can get away from that. Um, what we can do is we can offer like better metrics in the UI to help you sort of say, oh, I can actually see here that this is a cryo error because it's a serialization problem with like one of your closures. Like so, not really help the stack trace, but give you a little bit more tooling like on the UI to to help sort of narrow down like the problem. I don't think we can get away from the dollar signs. Unfortunately, okay. um, yeah, we just have to stop using like reduce the amount of time we use uh, that we um, that we rely on our logs for diagnosing. Is that it? Anyone have any other questions? Well, you guys can come find me after, and, and uh, if you guys have any anything that you want to say or complain <coughs> about, thank you. <laughs>